Praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it. Written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on conquering in all areas of your life. Revelation 21, 7. He who conquers and carries off the victory, which is what this word means, not just once in a while, but continually, present tense, ongoing action, shall inherit all things. We want to inherit everything. And I'll be his God, and he shall be my son if he meets these conditions. We're going to meet the conditions. We're going to conquer. We're going to be righteous. We're going to be holy. We're going on to perfection. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to give place to anything that is contrary to God's ways. We're going to come to the place of being a part of that glorified end time church. Well, we talked about conquering sin and how it's mandatory. And we also talked about conquering the world. The world is all polluted. We also talked about conquering the flesh because sin dwells in the flesh. And we understand that the law of sin is in our members. And so we're going to walk in spirit according to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that's made us free from the law of sin and death. Today we're going to talk about another important area, and that is conquering Satan. You have to conquer him if you are going to see the victory. He is at work to try to bring destruction, to try to get to you, to try to lead you down a wrong path. We are going to conquer him. We're going to be looking at what is going to be necessary to conquer Satan in all areas of our life. Of course, the things that he does, we're not going to do. And the things that he does, we're going to overcome everything that he does. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, we begin with. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Now, this word weaken is talking about his ongoing work in the nations, a participle active, meaning the continual weakening of the nations. That shows you what he does. Satan is at work to weaken not only nations, but he wants to weaken you. You got to guard yourself. You got to keep the word before you. You got to be ready to watch and pray so you don't give place to any of his attacks. And be ready to resist the devil steadfast in the faith because he's out to try to weaken you and to bring you down. You're to do the opposite. You're to get strong. You're to become mighty. You're to become full of power. That's what God wants. Every one of us are to make sure that we're getting strong through the Word, getting the power of God resident in us, that we think the Word, speak the Word, do the Word, and we will walk in victory. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Notice, he's doing what he wants to do. I will, I will, I will, I will. And the devil will try to work you to do the same thing, what you want to do. Are we to do what we want to do? No, we're to deny ourselves. If you do what you want to do, you'll be running your life from the flesh and or your soul. Instead, you're going to yield to the Spirit, and you're going to deny yourself, and you're going to put the Word of God first place. We must not do what I, I, me, me wants to do. No. He was not satisfied in the state he was in. I'll send above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the Most High. Yet you'll be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He'd like you really to be in putting yourself in the place of God so you're not submitted unto him. <laughs> well, that's what many people do. Pride is what caused him to fall. And pride is what he wants to get into people so that you kind of run the show and do whatever you want to do. You can't do that. That's a path of destruction. That's what happened to him, and that'll take you down just as well. You're going to conquer him by not giving place to any pride. You're not going to give place to that which would cause you to choose to do what you want to do. No, you're going to do what God says to do. That is going to be the way of victory. Ezekiel chapter 28. We here see here in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and that's Satan, who was over the prince of Tyrus, who was a man. 
and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He had tremendous wisdom, and he was a beautiful creature. He'd been in Eden, the garden of God. He'd seen what God had done in making man and all the things that he'd done. Every precious stone was thy covering. List all these different stones. He was a beautiful creature. He was the leader of the praise and worship. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes is prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. This means music was in him. The tablets speak of rhythm, timbrel and tambourine. The pipes speak of music being created from instruments. Music was in him. And of course, what has happened? He has perverted it now with the fall. That tells you something. He will try to get to you through music. Can you listen to anything that's ungodly? No. See, music can communicate things. There can be music that can incite you, music that can stir passions in you, music that will try to get you, that can actually conjure up demons and these kind of things. You may, must be sure that you don't listen to anything, any music that's ungodly. It is very sad that we see that the music of the world has been brought into many churches and they play it at the loudest decibels. You can hardly even understand what's going on. It's the spirit of the world, the music of the world that's been brought in. It's not of God whatsoever. Do not let yourself listen to it because there'll be, you'll have evil spirits that will come into you from the worldly spirit, from music that is not of God. You only want to listen to godly music. You don't want to listen to these things in the past, that you've heard in the past before you got born again. They're going to take you down. Verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. It was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity, which means unrighteousness, was found in thee. Everything that God creates is perfect. You trust totally in doing everything that He wants you to do, and He will accomplish His perfecting work in you. At the same time, unrighteousness got found in Him. Again, because he didn't do what God wanted him to do anymore. He now let pride get a hold of him. And we see that by the multitude of thy merchandise, he filled the midst of thee with violence. He sinned. He's going to cast his profane out of the mountain of God, destroy the oak covering cherub in the midst of the stones of fire, no longer in that position of the leader in praise and worship as an archangel. Notice his heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He got pride, prideful because of his beauty. He was a, had all this beautiful, beautiful stones. Don't ever get prideful about anything that you have or anything you've attained to or what you might look like or what, anything. Notice he says, Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to not the ground, it's really erets, which means the earth, which would be the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Remember, that Satan was not cast down to hell. It was all the evil other angels following him that were cast down to hell in the chains of darkness everlasting so they never could come to the light. There's no reconciliation for them. But Satan was cast down to the earth. He was to be a spectacle before all the kings that would be raised up over time in the nations. Um, he's gonna be, he says, I'm gonna bring thee to ashes upon the earth in sight of all them to behold thee. That's what was gonna happen course. Unfortunately, though, he was able to come to the garden because he was on earth and tempt man and man who had authority over the earth, given a lease of dominion, of course, disobeyed God and yielded to the devil and doing so transferred that authority into the hands of Satan, who then became the ruler of this world, the God over this age. We see that he's going to want you to do the same thing. He wants you to yield to pride. He wants you to yield to doing what you want to do. He wants to get you to listen to ungodly music. He wants you to do anything that will let evil come into you. He wants you to walk in the ways of unrighteousness. You must not allow any of that. You must make sure that you're guarding yourself, protecting yourself, only filling yourself up with the things that are of God. First Peter tells you that what he does now, that he is in that position as the ruler over this earth, in a position of being able to operate with the lease that he has to carry out his destruction, which is what he seeks to do. He's the adversary. 
1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, he's the one who's opponent against you. The devil, as a roaring lion, not that he is one, he walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's out to try to devour you. Notice, he's the adversary that opposes you. He will oppose everything of God in your life. That means anything that's trying to hinder you from doing what's right in the sight of the Lord, he will try to get you to oppose it and do whatever you want to do or compromise or, or anything that's, that's of the flesh or of the world, get you to do anything possible but the things of God. You must be ready to resist everything that he brings against you. Of course, when it speaks here of the adversary being that, it actually is the word antitikos, which comes from anti and dikos. Anti means against. Dikos is the word for righteous. He's against righteousness. He will, again, try to get you in unrighteousness, try to get you in lawless. Remember, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's the lawless one. And he will be speaking against everything that's of God. And he will want to, he'll be promoting unrighteousness and lawlessness, all these things. We got to be watchful. We got to be vigilant, as it says, and be ready to resist him, as it says in verse 9. Whom resist steadfast, strong, firm, immovable. Don't be a pushover for the devil. Resist him steadfast, strong, firm, immovable. This means, and then you do that with your faith, and you will come through victorious. God expects us to overcome, and we can overcome everything that he brings forth. We come to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the work of the, the enemy through the serpent. The serpent was more subtle or crafty and shrewd than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, so he approaches the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Was that what God said? No, not at all. We see that it's important you understand. She said, You're not supposed to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. Well, Genesis 2.9 says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight, good for food, and the tree of life in the midst of the garden. Well, that's the one they were supposed to partake of. And he's, she's thinking that you're not supposed to partake of it. Well, that was a lie. She didn't know the word. She didn't have things straight in her. Also in verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So, this tells you, he said about eating. What did she say? She didn't even have that straight either, because she said that we can't eat of it or touch it. Of course, she thought she was talking about the one in the midst of the garden, which was the tree of life. She was totally confused. So did she have the word of God in here? Her, her? no. Notice, who did, who did the devil go after? He went after the weak one, didn't he? The one who didn't know the word. That'll tell you something. Satan will go after the ones who are weaker. He'll try to get to everybody, but he'll especially go after the ones that are weak. And what makes you weak? if you don't have the word in you straight. You are only as strong as the level of the word that you have established in you, hear and do, and you know it. You are weak in the measure that you don't know the word. And Satan, he watches you, he knows what's going on. And if he sees your weakness, he will exploit that. He will look to get to you in those areas, especially where you don't know the word, he will come to tempt you, deceive you, do anything possible, try to confuse you, try to get you to do something contrary to the Word of God. And also, he'll try to get you to doubt the Word of God. You know, that's what she said, has God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden, trying to get you to doubt and question the Word of God. Don't ever question the Word of God. It is the truth. What God says is the truth. You need to believe it and do it. Don't compromise it under any circumstance. Whatever he says, you can't be reasoning in your mind and compromise it and decide to do what part you want and the other part just leave it out. No. 
We need to be doing everything that he says. So the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. He'll come to contradict what God says. Anything that comes to you that's a contradiction to what God says in his word, you know that's the enemy showing up to get to you. You've got to be ready to resist. You've got to be ready to take that thought captive. You've got to be ready to cast that down. If it's coming from any other source, you've got to be ready to bring correction to that one or get away from that person. You cannot allow yourself to receive anything that's contrary to the word. We're to take heed what we hear. We're to guard ourselves. God wants you to guard yourself against anything that would come against you. And notice, he said, God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened. You shall be, it says, as gods. But this is really not a good translation because this was the word Elohim, and this is also the word Elohim. Did they think that they were to be as gods, that there were plurality of gods? No, they only knew of one God. You know, the plural of the Godhead. This really, I like what, what Young's really has said is it'd be more accurate. You shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Otherwise, he's trying to get them to think, you want to be like God. Otherwise, be something that they're not. Of course, that's what happened to him. He wanted to be like God himself, something that he wasn't, remember? So he's trying the same thing he fell for. He's going to try, he tried to bring man to fall for the same thing. And it worked. <laughs> of course, she didn't know the word. And he appealed to her senses, appealed to her mind. We see in verse 6, when the woman saw in the senses the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, she got out of, instead of thinking of what the word said, which she didn't have straight anyway, and then start looking at the senses. Oh, that looks nice. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. Oh, I can, I'm going to become like God. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and it gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. She was deceived, remember, but the man was not. He knew exactly what he was doing. That meant he had the straight understanding of the word. He was not deceived. And yet he partook of it. What a mistake he made. So the devil will come to you, he'll lie to you, he'll try to deceive you. If you don't know the word, he knows, he, he watches you, he's pretty aware of what you know and what you don't know. He'll try to set you up for all kinds of a fall, and he will exploit your weakness in the areas, that's why you've got to get strong in all areas, and he will go after the weaker one if he can get to them in, in a situation, and that's of course what he will do. Don't, you have to reject all lies and you have to have the truth in you. He'll try to contradict the word, as we saw. And he'll try to get you to reason your mind and look in the senses so you get out of considering in the spirit the word of God. That's exactly what happens, so you make a wrong choice and influence her, and which is what happened. Got the focus off of God. If the enemy can get the focus off of God, he'll take you down. You cannot let yourself get your focus off of God. What does the Word say in every situation? Think on what the Word says and be a doer of it. That is mandatory. So we must get, the course, the precise, correct knowledge of God and have it straight in us so we're not deceived. We can't have it halfway known and then we get confused on something. He can, again, he can deceive you. The devil knows Scripture, remember, and the temptation, he brought it up. So you have to be ready to watch what he brings. And of course, the woman just didn't give it to her. He spoke to her, actually. Adam said, because thou hast, and he said to Adam, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife. She told him to do this. Well, he should have thought about what God said instead of about what someone else said. If someone says something to you, it's contrary to the word, doesn't matter who it is, don't listen to it or hearken to it or receive it. You need to resist giving place to it. And you need to bring correction to them and speak forth. No, this is what the Word says. You can't just, you know, let it pass. That's a compromise spirit. It's a mistake. And it's eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Oh, boy. So he's cursed. The ground was cursed. And sorrow, he was going to eat it all the days of his life. What a mistake. Don't listen to anybody that tells you anything contrary to the Word. You'll establish an ungodly soul tie with that person, and it will bring demons into you because you're giving place to the enemy. 
and it will take you down. You will see destructive effects in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled, deceived Eve through a subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity. This really is speaking about the single-hearted devotion to the Word in your mind that's in Christ. This is a word which really means a, a, a single-heartedness. of When you look it up in, in the lexicons, it really refers to a single-heartedness devotion which is what you're to be towards Christ. And of course, how's your mind going to get corrupted from that if he gets you off of the off of the word? And that's what happened. She looked at the senses, looked at reasoned in her mind, didn't consider the word whatsoever, and therefore she got corrupted. Don't let your mind get corrupted. Your mind will get corrupted anytime you get off of the word of God and you'll start thinking in your own mind reasoning. You can't be reasoning. You're going to give place to the enemy left and right. Always think on what the Word says. We see another scripture exposing what the enemy will try to do and what you must do to conquer and overcome. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 8. He that digs a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. When it talks about this breaking, this is something that would happen ongoingly because of walking contrary to the word. And how do we, how would we break a hedge? Through sin. Sin is going to bring the hedge down. That's what happened. Remember Job, the hedge got, came down because of his fear. You do you, anything contrary to the word, your hedge is down. And if the hedge is down, <laughs> Uh, the open door is there for the enemy to come in. And of course, the serpent type of the devil will come and bite you. You've got to make sure that you are not letting your hedge down. You're to be doing what? You're to be building your spiritual house. You're to be building things up so that you're strong and so that nothing can get to you. You need to build the spiritual house, lay in the foundation, and come to the place where you're never going to let your hedge down. Otherwise, the devil will be able to get to you. So you've got to guard yourself. Be able to resist all sin. Remember, sin's what takes the hedge down and opens up the door. We also see over in 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, first we're used to the word Satan. This is where, it's actually, it's the word Satan in the Hebrew where you get this word Satan from. And it means the adversary or one who withstands. He stood up against Israel and he tried, provoked David to number Israel. He wanted him to do anything but what God wanted. God didn't want, told David not to do that. It was a mistake. Well, he, he's going to stand up against you and try to withstand you from doing the word, but he's also going to try to get you, provoke you to do something that's contrary to the word. So he'll be against you doing the word, and then he'll also be driving you to do something contrary to the word. You can't let that happen. Remember, the adversary is going, is going to work every way possible to stop you from doing the word and also to get you doing something else, which will give place. Break down the hedge. Allow the enemy to have place. And of course, we need to obey. David, he didn't obey. He made a mistake. We've got to obey God's word and not do anything contrary to it. Also, the devil can, you will use other people. He can come directly at you, thoughts, lots of different ways of approaching you. Here in Psalms 109, verse 2, it says, For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. People that are not in tune with the word or in doing something false or contrary to the word or been deceived, anything that's contrary to the word, they're deceived in some way, they'll open themselves against you. They've spoken against me with a lying tongue. People will speak against you. They'll speak against the things that you bring forth. They'll speak against you in all kinds of negative ways to try to, you know, put you down in some way. Just you got to stand fast on the word. Don't be moved by what people say. 
you got to stand fast on the word. Really, don't let them affect you. Don't let it move you. You resist. You take those thoughts captive. Don't react to it. Don't get in the flesh. Just operate in the spirit. You do what the, cast those things down. Remember, we cast down every tongue that rises against us in any kind of judgment. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause even. Mm -hmm. People even come against you without a cause. They just decide what they're going to do against you even though they don't have any just cause. <laughs> don't think that people, people can be unreasonable, totally unreasonable, and do things like this. So don't be surprised. I wonder why they're doing this. I didn't do anything. What would cause them to want to come at me? <laughs> the devil, that's who. The devil will manipulate people to do evil things. You must not give place to them. For my love, they're my adversaries. That's right. They don't care what you're doing. They only want to bring the destructive effect of their vessels of the devil. But I give myself under prayer. What's, what's the answer for you? Pray the word. Speak the word. Pray and put God in operation. Pray and do what's right in God's sight so you can conquer the attacks of the enemy. Another thing you must realize is that if you do sin, now the hedge is down, and also Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12.10, I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation, strength, kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Now that hasn't happened yet, but it will which accuse them before our God day and night. What's he accuse us of? Of our sins or anything that's contrary. What does that do? That gives them a legal right to be able to come at you because of spiritual law that runs everything, and you can't stop those attacks until you deal with that sin and make sure you've confessed it, repented, turned from it, so he's got no grounds to effectively accuse you. You gotta make sure that you got an, oh, no open doors for him. He will accuse you before God, and he can be successful if you have sin in your life. Of course, he can come against you without cause, too. He doesn't have, he'll accuse you if there's an opportunity, but regardless, he'll try to come against you, but you can stop that. But if you are in sin and he successfully accuses you, you won't be able to stop his attacks. Remember, the, he's going to be able to come in because the hedge is down. The serpent will be able to bite you if you do not deal successfully with the areas of sin in your life. We come over to Zechariah, another thing we see. We're understanding how he works. We're understanding what we must do to conquer him. You're well able to conquer, remember, and to carry off the victory. Zechariah 3, 1, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. Now the devil was trying to stop him. He's the high priest. Well, the high priest, this guy had a problem because in verse 3 it says he was clothed with filthy garments. Can you function in the priesthood with filthy garments? No. You've got to get cleaned up. You've got to get holy. And so, of course, Satan's trying to stop him from getting rid of these filthy garments and stood before the angel, and he answered and spake to those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. If you're going to function as a priest, whether it's a royal priest or a holy priest, you're going to function in serving God, you need to get rid of the filthy stuff. The filthy garments got to be taken off of us. The enemy will try to stop you from taking off the filthy garments. He wants to keep them on you. He wants you to continue to walk in things that are contrary. Notice, he said, Behold, I've caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I'll close thee with a change of raiment. The iniquity, which is the open door for the enemy now to work against you, will pass from you when you get the filthy garments off of you. You get rid of all the filthiness of the flesh. You get rid of anything that's sinful in your life. And you've got to get a change of raiment. That's why we put off the old man. We talked about, we put on the new man. We clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. We clothe ourselves with the armor of God. You're going to get a change of raiment, and that's going to be the word in you, which is going to bring forth what God wants. So, you're going to have to get the change. All the filthiness needs to go out of your life, and we've talked about that. We're to get cleansed of every bit of filthiness, all uncleanness. It's to be eliminated, and also this includes casting out the demons. Remember, 
that we are to get rid of all of the filthiness. As 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the, we'd be modifying of the spirit. And what's of the spirit, this filthiness? The evil spirits that are in us. So we're gonna get rid of every fleshly thing, that's all sin, anything of the flesh, and we're going to get rid of the evil spirits. What's that gonna do? Perfect holiness in the fear of God. You and I, we're going on to holiness. We're walking in the fear of the Lord. We're going on to perfection. We're not going to compromise anything. We're going to hear and do the word and see God's complete work accomplished in us, which is what he wants. Every single one of us are to come to that place. We come to numbers. We're going to conquer everything that the enemy would bring against you. In Numbers chapter 13, they were told to go and possess the land. And before they went in to possess the land, First of all, they were to go and search it out and they were going to see the fruit of it. They returned from searching the land after the 40 days. They came to Moses, brought back word unto them, show them the fruit of the land. Oh, this, is, this is what you spoke of. This is the good land. And they said, we came to the land where thou sent us and surely it floweth the milk and honey. This is the fruit of it. So that was good. So that's the place we're going to go and possess. But... Here's the negative report from the majority. Two had the good report, but the 10 had the evil report. The few will walk in the right way and keep their eyes on the Lord. The many will not, unfortunately, as we know. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Did they just focus on what God wanted, find the fruit and come back? They started looking at all the things they saw. They started getting moved by what the enemy, the enemies that were there. Instead of having their eyes on the Lord, knowing God's going to give you the victory. He's greater and stronger than all these enemies. But instead, they started thinking of themselves. And they were thinking that uh, we saw the children of Enoch, they're the giants. And all these ones, and they're all over the place, everywhere. Well, Caleb, he tried to straighten them out. You know, the few will try to straighten out the majority by giving them the word of God if they'll listen. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. We're well able to overcome it. Because God's going to fight our battles for us. The battle's the Lord's and the victory's ours. When you put him in operation, he'll conquer all enemies. If you let the enemy get to you and you start focusing on other things other than him, well, you're going to be in trouble. And that's what happened to these guys, other guys. But the men that went up with them said, We be not able to go up against the people. And notice what their reason was, for they're stronger than we. Well, who are they now looking upon to conquer their enemies? Themselves. Their eyes were off of God. If you think you are going to win the victory yourself, you're kidding yourself. It's God working in you, remember. You're not doing it. You're just putting him in operation. Don't think for a minute that it's you doing it. You are involved in it by putting him in operation, by speaking and doing what his word says, but you're putting God in operation. God's the one who fights the battles for you. Well, that shows you. They got their eyes off of God and they were looking to themselves. Don't get your eyes on you. Get your eyes on God. Don't let the enemy, of course, you'll see the enemy and he is strong and mighty and he's stronger than you in, in the flesh, that's for sure. You can't overcome. They brought up an evil report of the land. Now they had a, instead of the fruit, this is the land, the good land, and now the tune changed. <laughs> Got an evil report of the land they searched out, saying, the land through, we've gone to search it. It's a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. Well, I thought you brought back and said it was the fruit, the good land. Well, their tune changed now. And all the people we saw are men of a great stature. Saw, saw, saw. Saw the giants, sons of Antioch, come of the giants. We were in their own, our own sight as grasshoppers. If you don't get your eyes on the Lord, you won't see who you are in Christ and what God will accomplish. If you look at anything else, it will begin to diminish you in your own sight. And that's what happened. We're in our own sight. We're like grasshoppers against these guys. That's a mistake. Don't look at yourself thinking that you're going to do it. 
You instead keep your eyes on the Lord is going to give you the victory. And so we were in their sight, and they got so deceived, they even believed the enemy believed they were grasshoppers. How would they know? They didn't have any contact with them. It tells the lies will not only get to you about how you look at yourself, but you'll even believe the enemy's lies. Greater lies will get a hold of you. And boy, you're really deceived by this time. These guys were totally deceived. And what a mistake they made. So they all, all the people wept because they weren't going to go in and possess the land. And of course, that was trouble for all of them. And they ended up going in the wilderness and they all ended up dying out because they didn't obey the Lord. If you get your eyes off the word, you look through the flesh, you look any way, you look to your own ability, you think the devils are stronger than you, that means your focus is on you, that's a mistake. You think, well, I don't think I am strong enough to overcome this. <laughs> now your eyes are on you. You're going to look to God. The Lord is the strength of your life, the Word says. Psalms 27, verse 1, talks about that. Otherwise, you get your eyes off, you'll be deceived. You'll deceive yourself. I'm a grasshopper. You'll be even deceived what the enemy says. Oh, they're, they think I'm a grasshopper too. How are you going to ever conquer the enemy if you think he's, going to, he's stronger than you and can conquer you? There's no way. You've got to believe the Word and know it's God in you that's going to give you the victory. Remember, it's God who has given you the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God who is always causing you to triumph in all things in Christ. It is God who said you're to be completely victorious always as you put Him in operation. It's God who said greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the, earth, the world, even our faith, which puts Him in operation. It's the faith of Jesus, remember? So, we cannot give place to the enemy again. You see, every one of these cases all involves the Word, doesn't it? If you don't have the Word in you, you're not thinking the Word, speaking the Word, doing the Word, established in the Word, huh? you're not going to get victory. As the Word is in you, so will you be. So, you got to take a good look. You know, what's the level of the Word in me? How strong am I? How firm am I? How much knowledge do I have? How much am I putting in operation? How much of a focus am I on the Word? Do I get my eyes off the Word? If so, you are in trouble. Now, another thing we have to realize, the devil will be, he'll, he's out to destroy you every which way possible, but he will take whatever you can give him. He'll take the little by little and he'll keep on pressing to advance towards his goal. We can see this. Joel 1.4 talks about what happened. That which the palmer worm, the locust hath left, is the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. The palmer worm, when you look this word up in the lexicons, it's a word that means the gnawer who wears away by persistent biting. Working at you, working at you, working at you, working at you, trying to wear you down. The next word, the locust, this is the word which means the swarmer, it's a locust swarmer, who overruns, throngs you, really comes against you, bringing tremendous disturbance against you. He stepped up his attacks because he's already made some inroads, so he's not going to just lie back and say, you know, well, we caused some problems here. No, he's going to keep pressing. He's going to do more. And the next one, then, is this canker worm, which is the licker or the devourer, the devouring one. It's a caterpillar as a devouring one, but it's like a, it really, in different lexicons it refers to the licker or the devourer. Well, that's one who's beating and thrashing and striking with repeated blows. Remember, that's what's happened to, to Paul was getting hit. The devil was making a lot of inroads at him and hitting him and just striking at him repeatedly until he got turned around. And then the caterpillar, well, that's where he wants to come to. And this is the guy who is the consumer, the ravager, taking you wholly, devastating you, and doing ruinous damage. This word means the casile. That's what he wants to do. He'll take a little, but he won't stop there. He'll keep pressing. He can get you to back off a little. He'll try to get you to back off more, to back off more, back off more, turn a little bit more away, keep on pressing until he takes you down totally. You've got to be ready to resist him at the first attack. Well, you know, it didn't, didn't do too much damage to me. Oh, yeah, it's done some damage to you, and he's not going to stop. He's coming after you more. You've got to be ready to resist every attack that comes to you. 
Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Do not give place to anything that would come at you. Anything that rises up, you jump on it immediately and resist it with the Word of God and conquer it. He'll work little by little and try to increase the intensity until he really takes you down. Some people that don't, don't resist him, they wonder how I was here. Oh, how did I get over here? Fell, look how far away I've gotten where I was at one time. And that means the devil's really done a lot of work and you didn't stop him along the way. And here you are, way over here, way off track and out of sync with the things of God. What a mistake. You got to be ready. Ready, willing, watch and pray so you don't enter into any temptations. So you're ready to resist every attack that the enemy would bring against you. That is so important. Daniel, chapter 3, verse 15. This is where Nebuchadnezzar set up that image to be worshipped. It's going to happen again, remember. If you're ready at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, and all these different ones, you fall down and worship the image I've made well. But if you worship not, you're going to be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And then he adds, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Why would he add that? Because he knew these guys stood for God. And so he's attacking any belief that they might have with their threats. Oh, he's going to throw me in the fiery furnace? He's going to throw that dart at you. God's not going to deliver you out of this. He's a liar. Anything that comes against you, you must cast it down immediately. Don't think on it. Don't mull over it. Don't revolve it in your mind. Don't think, well, I wonder if this could happen or not. No. You jump on that and get rid of it right away. Well, also, you have to be ready to give the answer to the attack. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said to the king, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, if you throw us in the fiery furnace, he's going to conquer, you're going to com combat and, c and come against the lie, he said, God's not going to deliver you. He said, no, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us. You can't say, well, I know God's able. You've got to know what he will do, because you're going to put him in operation. He will deliver you out of thine hand. The people who will be delivered when these things occur are the ones who know their God, and they not only know he's able to deliver them, but they declare he will deliver us. At the same time, if not, if you don't throw us in the fiery furnace, it's talking about, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Can we compromise and think that we can stand against attacks? No. We're uncompromised. We're not about to give place to this. This principle's true in everything. Anything that tries to get you to compromise will take you down. You have to have a stand against Satan's attacks. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to speak what the Word says, and I'm not going to give in to any of these things that are trying to get me to do something contrary to the Word. You've got to take a stand. You can't just kind of back off a little bit. Okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'll give in a little here. Big mistake. <laughs> what a mistake. It'll take hold of you. It reminds me of the guy, a preacher out there, who used to, he understood the paganism of, of the December 25th celebration, and he got rid of it out of his life. But then he came to the place where he, somewhere, he got, well, I guess maybe it's not so bad, and his, his family, even though they knew it was pagan, wanted to get involved in celebrating and everything. And he said, so he said, I gave in and we've been celebrating it ever since. <laughs> oh, he gave in, huh? You take a step back, you're going down. He got a hold of him. This guy shouldn't even be in the ministry. He's in paganism. What a mistake. Don't take a step back. It'll get a hold of you. And you gotta guard yourself against anything and everything. No God will deliver you. No compromise. Resist steadfast in the faith. Also, you have to watch. P. 
people can be a vessel of the devil. Genesis chapter 49. We see over here in verse 17, talking about Dan. That was one of the tribes of Israel. They should have been walking in the ways of the Lord. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way. He's going to be a bad guy. An adder in the path that bites the horse's heel so his rider shall fall backwards. He's going to do things to call the, cause them to fall. Got to watch that people won't do things to cause you to fall. Because if you give place, and this is a person who apparently, you'd think he was a tribe, he, he's one of the children of Israel. He must be okay. Like a Christian, you know? Huh. They try to do anything to take you off the right path. You're going to fall. Just like this guy. It sucks about the rider falling backwards. Look what Dan ended up doing in 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 28. Here's where the king took the council and made two calves of gold. This is in Samaria, the northern tribe. And said unto them, It's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Well, they fell for that thing once and got <laughs> tremendous judgment. You'd think, why did they fall for that again? <laughs> but they did. They're going to fall for that again, again, later on, because this is all type of what's going to happen down the road. You set up one in Bethel? That's the house of God. You can't be setting anything that's idolatrous in the house of God. Any church that puts a Christmas tree in their church is a has put that in Bethel, an idol in their place. <laughs> They're in trouble. And the other it put in Dan. <laughs> well, that's a mistake, because Dan was the one who was going to lead him down a wrong path. This thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. You can't have any paganism, or you can't have any compromise or anything that's not of God that would cause you to sin in your life. And, of course, what was the result? What happened for uh, Dan? You think he wasn't, he wasn't going to have a judgment coming upon him? Oh, he had a judgment come for sure. Because he's not one of the tribes, the 12 tribes listed in Revelation. He's eliminated. Amos 8.14, They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, that was a sin, that's where they were when they did that, Thy God, O Dan, liveth. A uh, lie. And the manner of Bersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Idolatry will take you down forever. You can't have idols before you. Dan's not listed in the tribes, the 12 tribes. He's eliminated because he did evil things. You cannot let people be a vessel of the enemy that will lead you astray. You've got to guard yourself. That's why doctrine's important. That's why who you fellowship with is important. That's why you're told to set the boundaries. You're not to touch any unclean thing. That's why we're told that we're not to have fellowship with anybody who's not walking right in line with the Word of God whatsoever. No. This is the plot of the devil to take you down. And it took Dan down. He's eliminated. We come over to Matthew. Chapter 4, we see Jesus and the temptation was coming against him and how Satan worked against him. Verse 3, when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He tries to get you to doubt, you know, are you, if you're the Son of God, you know, I'm trying to get him to have to prove that he's the Son of God. You don't have to prove anything. Don't let the devil try to get you to prove anything to him. You don't have to prove anything. You just speak the word, take dominion, cast them out, do the word. Don't even get in any conversations with them or anything. You don't have to, you know, I see people do that when, they, when they're of casting out demons. Just say, you know, they're saying, I have authority over you, devil. Why are you saying that? You're trying to prove something to them. That's crazy. Just command them to come out in the name of Jesus. You don't have to talk to them and tell them anything. <laughs> Who are you trying to prove? What are you trying to do? You know, there's no reason to do that. Just use your authority and cast them out. 
You don't need to try to prove who you are or whatever all. That's what he tried to do with Jesus. Uh, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How are you to live? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You put the word of God first place. That's the way you're to live. He sets him on the pinnacle of the temple. If thou be the Son of God, cast thy side da down. Now he's tempting God. You've got to discern what the devil will try to do. He was tempting God. And of course, he has a scripture. I'm going to throw a scripture to you. He knows a scripture to try to deceive you. But it was if you're casting yourself down, you're tempting God. There's no reason to do that. You cast, he knows the scripture. He'll give his angels charge concerning you, and in your hands they'll bear you up, lest any time I dash thy foot against a stone. From Psalms 91. Jesus said, It's written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't fall for any of his tricks. Even if someone brings a scripture to you, but it's off track, it's not the real deal of what the temptation is, and it's not the real, it's trying to lead you off what what the person's trying, what the devil's trying to do in that situation. People try to manipulate you through things. You got to be on top of things and be able to see the motivation and what's the real temptation, what's the real answer. He takes them, shows them all the kingdoms of the world. He says, all these will I give thee, which he had to give, if thou will fall down and worship me. So he's dangling all these kingdoms before him. Just fall down and worship me. Of course, Jesus, he just dealt with the temptation. He dealt with the answer to it. That's all you need to do. Speak the word that's the answer to it. Don't get in the flesh, you know. You dirty, rotten, terrible devil. Come on. That's a bunch of railing accusation, which is ridiculous. <laughs> You're actually in sin by doing that. You're told not to bring a railing accusation against him, the scripture says. You just tell Jesus, how did he deal with it? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It's written. The Word of God is the power that will deal with us successfully. Don't get in the flesh and dealing with the devil. And give him one of your little peace of mind rants. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's all fleshly stuff. Yes, it is. Speak the Word. Do what is right. Just resist. Every, every case, he, how did he get the victory? The Word. It's written, it's written, it's written, it's written, it's written. That's how you're going to contact him, conquer him. And the devil leaveth him. He may not leave right away, but you just keep the word going and it'll take care of the situation. But it will extinguish every fiery dart that comes against you because you hold up the shield of faith. The devil, of course, will try to work, and he's already he's worked in everybody, to get demons into them. Matthew 4, 24, fame went throughout all Syria. They brought into him all sick people, taken with diverse diseases, torments, those who were possessed with devils were under the power of demons. Those who were lunatic, those had palsy, and he healed them. All the things that the devil has done, you have authority to conquer them. You must understand, God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Luke 9, 1, he called his 12 disciples together, gave them power, dunamis, and authority, exousia, over all devils and to cure diseases. You have authority over all evil spirits. You have authority Oh, to cure diseases, it says. You can cast out the demons and take hold of the power of God and see God bring forth the promises for you in your life. At the same time, you can't be moved by what these demons, the power that they have, because they do have power. Matthew chapter 8. Look at what's said here in verse 28. When he was come to the other side in the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils come out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no man, no one, might, this is the word iskolo, if you notice below, pass by that way. Otherwise, because of the demons in them, these ones had mighty, forceful strength, is what that iskolo means. Nobody could get by because they'd, they'd stop them. The devils do have tremendous power and might. But remember, you have authority and power over all the power of the enemy. It doesn't matter what they have. It matters what God has, and you're putting him in operation because he's given you authority, and you have power in you. You have a spirit of power, and you get the power of God in you. 
you get yourself full of the word with a mighty force, you're going to conquer the enemies. You will be able to overcome, but they do have, they are strong, they have mighty force. And they can cause all kinds of problems. We need to be ready to cast them out. Of course, what's the answer? We're going to bind those spirits and we're going to cast them out. Mark 16, 17. You're going to overcome devil, the devil by casting them out. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out the devils. Every believer is to cast out demons. Don't think that you can't cast them out. You're a believer. You're going to do it in the name of Jesus. You're just going to speak, but who's going to bring them out? God's authority and power is going to be operating through you that is going to bring them out. In fact, you and I are commanded to be casting out these demons. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, he commands, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you receive, freely give. These are all commands. We're, to be com we're commanded to cast out all these evil spirits. Now in Matthew chapter 12, so you're going to cast out the demons and conquer their works. Don't let yourself kind of let things go on not casting out demons, not engaging in driving them out. They aren't going to leave, remember, until they get cast out. And they'll be working. Matthew 12, verse 22, This brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And how did he do this? He was casting out the demons, because they accused him of casting out the demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Well, we come down to verse 26, and Jesus said, If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself, and how shall his kingdom stand? This tells you that Satan has a kingdom. He has a kingdom of darkness. But God's kingdom, of course, the kingdom of light, is, of course, superior. Nonetheless, he has a kingdom. And, of course, how did he do this? He said, no, I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Then the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God has come unto you. You and I have been delivered out of the authority of darkness. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You're in a position of authority. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above all principality and power and might. You are in a position of authority over all evil spirits in the heavenlies, as well as in the earth, as well as evil spirits that are in you or in others as you go to minister to believers that are born again and are, have met the prerequisites for deliverance, you can cast them out of them and you can see them be set free. Now, verse 29 says, you're going to enter in the strong man's house, which is a demonic house in you. Spoil his goods, except you first bind the strong man, and then you'll spoil his house. Binding, you bind Satan and these evil spirits, tying them up, and then you begin to cast them out and command them to come out. And remember, these spirits have come into you from inheritance, from your own sins, and from victimization. You have dominion. If you're going to conquer Satan, you're going to be involved in deliverance. Don't shy away from deliverance. Of course, we know the great majority of all Christians out there have been taught the lie that they don't have any demons in them once they're born again, and they've been deceived. Of course, remember, casting out demons is one aspect of what all we need to do. It's not the only thing that we need to do. That's important to understand. We know from over in Luke, in chapter 8, Verse 35, this is the guy who got set free from the demons in his mind. They went out to see what was done and came to Jesus, found the man out of whom the devils were departed. So the demons were cast out. But what else was it? He was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Well, what is that talking about? Remember who is the one who was sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing his word? Mary, remember? That means continually hearing the word. And clothed. Well, what happens if you're hearing the word and you put it in operation? When it says clothe, this is perfect tense, meaning in completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking, meaning he has been clothed in the past. Meaning, you got to get the word in you, correct all the problems, get the knowledge of God, get clothed, having put on the word in you in all areas, and the demons being cast out, it's the whole package. And then the guy was in his right mind. Otherwise, you need the word in you. You need to make sure that you have seen this putting on of the new man in you 
and you also cast out the demons and you will be set free. Now, when you do this, you're bringing God's rule and reign into your life. And the song that we sing, it's a great song. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15. It comes from this verse and the one in Matthew. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. What are your judgments from? From sin. They've come from inheritance. Remember, those are judgments while we have inherited generational iniquity curses. He hath cast out thine enemy. How do you get rid of that which has been forcing the judgments? You cast the demons out. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. That means God's rule and reign is coming into you. The kingdom is manifesting in you. Thou shalt not see evil any more. <laughs> Tremendous. This is why you've got to drive the enemies out. Of course, you've got to get rid of the sin. You've got to do the whole works. We cast out. We conquer the sin. We conquer the world. We conquer the flesh, as we've talked about. And we're going to conquer the devil. We're going to cast out the demons. We're going to see you come to the place of being free and liberated. We're not going to see evil anymore. Get your focus on what God will produce for you in your life as you do what he says. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. So you, casting out demons is, is something every Christian needs to do and must do. Matthew 13, verse 58. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Well, that means the devil will try to get you into some sort of unbelief. Well, you can't let that happen. You believe the Word. You do what the Word says. You act upon it. You put it in operation in your life. It's going to hinder. If, you don't have, if you're not operating in faith, is he going to be able to do anything? No. Guard yourself. Don't let yourself get double-minded. Don't doubt. Don't wonder, waver. None of that whatsoever. The devil will try to get you in it. So watch the thoughts that come in your mind. Watch looking at the circumstances or the situations that will influence you adversely. It will affect you and get you double-minded or get you to doubt. You've got to guard yourself. Matthew chapter 14. We see over here in verse 29. And Peter's walking on the water. He said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. When he saw the wind boisterous again, what he saw, the enemy will try to get your attention on what he's doing and off the Lord. He was, had his eyes on the Lord. Now he saw the wind strong and mighty, Iskaros. And what happens if you get your eyes off of the Lord, off the Word, and you start looking at what the enemy's doing? <laughs> it brought fear into him because he didn't do something that he should have done with his faith to conquer the enemies. Instead, he let it affect him. And if you don't do something, it will affect you. And in this case, it brought fear into him. You just can't just kind of just, just kind of sit back and Think about what you're going to do. You know, with the word, what he wants you to do. He wants you to, to speak to that and command that thing to be removed. Or command it to be peace, be still, as Jesus would do. And know what, ha know what happens when you get in fear. Well, what happened? Now the hedge is down. Are you going to be strong and able to stand against anything? No. Beginning to sink. That shows a spiritual, spiritual work going on. You're beginning to sink spiritually. He cried said, Lord, save me. He's not operating now in spirit, walking on the water as he was, looking at Jesus. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hands, caught him and said, O thou of little faith. That shows you what happened. He got in, he, his faith was not an operation because he got into distazo, doubt. Distazo means two stands. Die and stazo from stand, the word stand. Two stands. Well, you can't be in two stands. You've got to be single-minded. If you're being influenced by a negative thing, even though you might be in, you still have this one stand, it's going to affect you. Remember, the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We see this over in James chapter 1, verse 7 where it says, let not that man think that he shall take hold of anything of the Lord, because what was he doing? He was wavering. 
And what happens then? He's a two-souled man, Daisukos. He's unstable in all his ways. Can you stand against the enemy if you're two-souled and you're unstable? No. You'll be able to take you down. God wants stability in your life. The Word of God will bring stability, strength, get you firmly established. You get the foundation laid. You got the hedge up because you're doing the Word. You're seeing God. You're building your spiritual house so nothing can get to you. I remember what it said down here in James 4, 8, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinful ones, it's referring to as an adjective. Purify your hearts, you two-souled. That tells you another reason why your faith's not going to work. If you're two-souled, it's causing an impurity in your heart because that's a means into your heart. You have to have your heart be pure and single-hearted, which means you're going to have to be single-souled because your soul is a gateway through your mind into your heart. you got to guard it. This is why the Word gets written where? Two places, in your heart and in your mind. So you got it in your heart, that's where faith's going to be released from. But you get it in your mind that maintains hope, and that's important to have the mind of Christ so you don't give place to any attacks. That's why it's mandatory for you to take your thoughts captive. Again, if you're going to conquer the enemy, you got to excel at taking your thoughts captive. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations, this really mean, refers to reasonings. Don't be reasoning in your mind on things. If the Word says it, you're going to do it. That's it. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I might, maybe that's not the right thing to do in this situation. On, whatever he tries to pull on you. Oh, no. Now you're going into the reasoning mode in your mind. and You're in trouble. You cast down these reasonings. And every high thing that exalts itself or raises in itself in estimation against the knowledge of God. In other words, the knowledge of God says, do this. Something's coming along and says, oh no, this would be better than that. <laughs> you kind of put this above the knowledge of God. You're in trouble. If the Word says such and such, don't let anything rise above it. Now you let the uh, reasonings, the ma things from the enemy come in. And what do you do with every thought? You bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How do I bring a thought into obedience of Christ? You replace it with the Word, what the Word says. You're going to think on what the Word says or speak what the Word says, focus on what the Word says, and cast down that thought and not let that thought in your mind. The worst thing you can do is revolve it and think about it and ponder it and meditate on it, you know, that thing. Cast that down. Get the Word in you. Don't get that. Let that have place in you. It's going to be working you. And it's bringing you down is what it's doing. You're to have a readiness. Prepared and ready, this means. To revenge all disobedience, which is what the whether you realize or not, the thoughts, the reasonings, anything trying to replace or rise up above the Word, that's the enemy coming. That's the disobedience trying to get to you, working at you. And it's going to, you're going to be successful when your obedience is fulfilled because you have done what the Word says and you have conquered the attacks of the enemy, which is mandatory, what he wants you to do. You also have to watch the enemy's will try to even do things that seem like, seemed like the right thing to do. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. If we back up two verses, we see that Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, scribes, be killed, be raised again the third day. How did that go over with them? We don't want to see that. They started reasoning in their minds, started thinking what they thought. Instead of just believing what Jesus said, okay, and maybe wanting to get, find out revelation about more. No, oh, what was the response here? Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, this shall not be unto thee. Where did he get that from? Himself. 
his own reaction, his own response, for whatever reason it might be. You cannot make your own response. Now you're in sin because you are giving place contrary to the word of God. What happened? He turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Well, that means Satan was operating in Peter. You mean to tell me if I get off the word of God and I'm thinking something that's not correctly, it, the devil's come into me? That's right. Because you gave place to him in your mind. And now you're in trouble. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For you savor, or you, or your mind, is what this is really taught me, your, your way of thinking, your mindset, is what this word phreneo really means, is to have this minding, as Young's brings out, you do not, not minding the things of God, but those that are being of men. You're not minding the things of God, you're minding the things of men. What, what you think you ought to do, or what someone else might want you to do, or however you feel about the situation, big mistake. Anytime you get your eyes off of the Word, you're not minding the things of God anymore. And the devil's made an inroad into your life. No, you need to have your mind set on the things of God, not on the things that maybe you think might be right in the situation. How you reason or how you feel or what, 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 what I ought to do, you know. Well, what the Word say? Well, my mind, you know, it seemed very reasonable. Be far from me. This is not supposed to happen to you and be killed. We don't want that. Totally reasoning his mind and deciding from his own standpoint what he thought. You can't do that. You decide what you think without considering what the Word says. You are going in the wrong direction. And the devil has come into you. And that's exactly what we see happen. And then Jesus goes on and he gives them what you really need to do in every situation. Jesus said to his disciples, if any man wills, that's is the main word in the clause, is willing, ongoingly, to come, which is what Peter should have been doing, infinitive, to come after me, what's he supposed to do? Deny himself. Was Peter denying himself? No, he was thinking totally of himself. I don't want this. <laughs> you can't think of yourself. It's a mistake. Take up his cross, and when it says denying yourself, this means lose sight of oneself and one's own interests. Well, that means your agenda is out of the way. You put God's agenda first place instead. Take up his cross, this is crucifying of the flesh, and follow me by putting the word of God first place and doing the things that he wants for you to do. And you can't reason this and deal with it from the soulish realm attitude. Because he goes on and says, whosoever will save, keep sound his suke soul life, Otherwise, he's running the show from his soul, what he thinks, what he feels, what I was reasoning. Be it far from thee, Lord. <laughs> they're going to destroy that because they're giving place to the devil just like he did and the evil spirits came in. Whosoever will destroy and put out of the way entirely his suke led life for my sake shall find it because you're always going to do, remember you're living unto him, not unto yourself. You can make major mistakes by reasoning from the soul, reasoning things instead of finding out what the Word says and getting what God wants for you to do. That is important. Remember, he said back there that you're an offense unto me. Here he the devil will be an offense, try to be an offense unto you. He'll try to trap you. He'll try to cause you to stumble or fall, this word means. He'll do whatever he can to take you down. Whether it's reasonable or not. Whether it seems like the right thing to do or not. What a mistake. Look what it says here in Matthew 13, verse 41. 
The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend the ones who are getting trapped and stumbling and falling. And also those who are doing lawlessness on Amia. What's going to happen to these guys? They're in trouble. They're going to be cast in the furnace of fire, wailing and gnashing of teeth because they weren't choosing the way of the Lord. We can't make that mistake. How about people, how the people offend in doctrine or offensive in doctrine because they're contrary to the Word of God? Romans 16, verse 17. Look what it says. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses causing you to stumble, fall, trap you, contrary to the doctrine. Anybody that causes division or causing you to stumble or fall or be off track regarding doctrine, which you've learned that you're supposed to take heed to and make sure you're only going to walk in line with it, you're only going to be in fellowship with people in line with it, what do you do? Avoid them. Turn aside from them. Turn away from them. Shun them, this word means. And this is a command to you and me. That means, can I, co can I compromise for people that have false doctrine? Can I be in fellowship with someone who's having false doctrine? No. I'm going to speak the truth to them. You know, one person sometime back, and they called me and said they liked all the things that they were hearing on the radio, but they didn't believe in the casting out of demons. They were against that. And of course, my response was, well, the Word says, because what am I going to tell them? The Word. The Word says, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. Well, he just kind of passed that off, you know, didn't want to <laughs> consider it all. And then he made this little statement that, uh, well, we're just going to agree to disagree. You hear people say that? I'm not going to agree to disagree. If I agree to disagree, I just put myself in division. Instead, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm not going to agree to disagree with you because I know you've got to come to the truth. <laughs> I'm not about to disagree with you just to be in harmony so we can kind of function together while I believe this and you believe that. Agree to disagree is of the devil. Don't ever agree to disagree with someone. I disagree with you because it's contrary to the word and here's what the word says. I'm not about to agree to disagree with you. I'm going to keep telling you the truth. And if you don't want to hear, that's going to be your choice. Don't agree to disagree. You just put yourself in the position. Okay, yeah, I'll be divisive with you. You're here and I'm here and we're in division. No. <laughs> That's not of God whatsoever. You're supposed to instead stand up and bring the truth and avoid those ones that will be trying to deceive you. Doctrine's important. Am I going to be in fellowship with people that are going to be involved in, uh, let's say, like the pagan Christmas celebration? No way. Now, does that mean I can't walk into a store where every store's got a Christmas tree up there, you know? No, I'm not in fellowship with them. I'm just going about my business of doing the things I need to do. But am I going to go and spend time or be in someone who has got that, they're in fellowship with that and, then, you know, and so forth? No. No way. Am I going to be running around with somebody who's got a doctrine contrary to the Word of God? Well, you know, I don't believe in speaking in tongues, you know, but the other guy says, I do believe in speaking in tongues. Well, that means if I get around him, boy, I can't speak in tongues because they'll get offended because they don't believe in that. So what are you going to do? I'm not going to speak in tongues when we pray. Oh, okay, so you're going to compromise and shut down what you believe because that you might offend them, huh? Yet God tells you you're supposed to pray with your spirit and with your mind in line with the Word. So what are you doing even having fellowship with them in the beginning? <laughs> you shouldn't be, unless you're going to be, you know, I'm going to start praying in tongues. They're going to get all mad and upset. Well, you shouldn't have been in fellowship with them to begin with. You should have given them the truth and given them the Word. 
Same thing about deliverance. You know, you cannot be in fellowship with people that, are, don't have, that have a, a doctrine contrary to you. The Bible says they're causing, of course, division from the truth and offense contrary to the doctrine you've learned. You're commanded to avoid them. That's what we do. That's what God wants for everybody. It's amazing how people will not listen and take heed to things. Look what it says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you. Well, that's not a nice suggestion. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you withdraw yourselves. Well, it doesn't mean be around them, does it? From every brother. Well, that's any Christian that walks disorderly and not after the tradition you received of us, which is what? The Word of God. The traditions are the traditions of the Word of God, not traditions of men, that's for sure. Otherwise, I'm not going to be in fellowship with them. Fellowship with them. If I'm going to be around them, I'm going to be giving them the Word, giving them the truth, sharing the truth with them. We cannot, we got to be, this is Satan deceiving people and getting them into compromise. And we're not about to agree to disagree with anybody, that's for sure. We're going to be in agreement with everybody because what are we supposed to do? Every one of us are to come to the place of being like what he spoke to the Corinthian church. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you all speak the same thing. That's right. Every one of us are going to speak the same thing. That's what we're going to do, and that's who you and I are going to be in fellowship with. Be no divisions among you. How can I be with someone that's divisive when the Bible says there's supposed to be no divisions among you? I'm violating the word, aren't I? And that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Well, that means we have the, we're have we thinking the same. We're on the same page, right? And the same judgment or viewpoint in the way we perceive, view things. It's astounding. The devil will try to get you into compromise. And then you're in trouble because you have compromised the word of God. That is a big mistake. One last scripture before we stop. Matthew 26. What must you do so you don't give place to the enemy's temptations? Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The temptation itself is not sin. It's whether you enter into it by responding to it, acting upon it, taking hold of it, yielding to it, letting it affect you adversely because you didn't respond with the word. How do you respond to the te temptation? It's written. It's written. Extinguish it. Shield of faith. Conquer it. The spirit is, deed is ready and willing. How do we operate? We walk in spirit, don't we? We operate in spirit. So you have to know your spirit's always ready and willing to do the right thing. Well, I didn't feel like it. Well, that wasn't from the spirit. Well, I wasn't thinking that way. That wasn't from the spirit. Because you weren't yielded to the spirit by thinking what the word says. Your spirit is always ready and willing. The flesh is strengthless or weak, infirm, feeble. It will always fail you. That's for sure. You're going to walk in spirit. The devil will try to get you to respond out of the flesh. And then you'll enter into the temptation and he's been successful against you. No. We're going to do what's right. We're going to watch, be spiritually attuned. We're going to pray the word of God. We're going to be ready to speak the word of God, ready to resist the temptation. We're not going to, we're going to conquer the devil's attacks. Any and all attacks of the devil are to be conquered in your life. And you can conquer them all. And you can walk victorious. Jesus conquered them all. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He conquered every single thing. And how did he do it? We already saw what he did in the temptation. It's written, it's written, it's written, it's written. It's written, it's written, it's written, it's written. If you don't speak, it's written. And what the Word says, they're probably getting through to you. Don't give place to them. Walk in the ways of the Word of God, and we will conquer the devil, and we do the word. So we get the word in us, 
We resist the devil's attacks. We conquer every temptation. We also get on the attack and cast out the demons and get, drive out the enemies. We cast them down from the heavenlies. We engage in the warfare and we conquer everything of the devil. You're in the army of the Lord and you're to conquer and be totally victorious. That's what he wants for every single one of us. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that reveals the workings of Satan. And I thank you. I have authority over all the power of the enemy. And the word of God is the answer to every temptation to conquer every work of the devil. I am getting the word in me. I understand. I'm only as strong as the level of the word in me. But if the enemy can get to me, that shows I'm weak in the word. I will not allow myself to be weak in the word. I will get strong. I will know the word. I will speak the word. I will think on the word. I will take every thought captive. I'll be ready and willing as my spirit is to do what the word says. I will not reason in the mind. I will not respond out of the soul. I will not respond out of my feelings or what I see in the senses. I will think of what the word says and I will go forth and do it and put God in operation who will conquer all my enemies. I thank you that you are my victory. I will conquer every attack of the enemy when I hear and do the word and I will cast out the demons. I will speak to mountains. I will resist every attack steadfast in the faith. I will conquer everything that Satan tries to do. I thank you for giving me the victory as I'm a hearer and a doer of your word in Jesus name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We'll be hearers and doers of this word. We will conquer Satan and all of his works so he has no place. We're not going to let him anything take down the hedge. We're going to be ready to resist everything. We're going to walk in your ways and we're going to walk in total victory. Then we'll inherit all things. You'll be our God and we will be your child. Thank you for manifesting your tremendous work in our life to conquer the devil because we're hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.